Welcome to the Haunted Hacker podcast number, let's just do February.1. Um, this is the first episode this month. And today we have Mary Galloway on, who is a friend of a friend and has a really interesting story. Um, I met her electronically through TechStrong TV, who uh, promotes and, and replays the, the Haunted Hacker podcast three times a week on Digital Anarchist. Uh, so I'm sure it's going to be an interesting time and uh, a lot of fun. So before we get started, I'll talk about some news. Um, right now, I'm scheduled to speak tentatively in Frankfurt, Germany in May at the uh, Cloud Security Conference Summit. Um, also with ICE sometime in the next month or two. And a lot of podcasts are going on. I'll be on um, uh, Simon... Uh, Simon's webs, uh, webcast, uh, sponsored by Valor, and a few others coming up. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'll introduce Mary Galloway. And uh, Mary, I'm so glad you're here. It's a pleasure having you on the show. I've heard a lot about you. Uh, good things, of course. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, right? right? So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, I won't spoil the... The excitement and uh, we can just launch right into it. Awesome. So hello everybody. My name is Mary Galloway. Happy to be here. Um, calling in, dialing in, zooming in from sunny Las Vegas. Um, I've been in cybersecurity and tech for over 12 years. I got my start um, as a network engineer for a company called Accenture working on some of their government contracts. Um, I used to drive 53 miles one way to get to that job. <laughs> Oh, commitment. Yeah, from, from Southern Maryland to Ashburn, Virginia. Wow. Um, and it sucked. If you've ever been in that area, you know traffic over there is just awful. No way. Um, so I got my start as a network engineer. Um, one of my first big projects was doing out of band management for um, NGA, which is the National Geospatial Agency. They were moving from um, there are all of their different locations in the DC area to one location in Springfield. And so we nice. managed. Um, that transition for them. Um, I almost quit that job because <laughs> they wouldn't let me touch the equipment because I was new. Um, but, you know, it worked out. I stayed there for a while. Then I ended up moving to North Carolina, um, Fort Bragg to be specific. And that's when I got my first taste of true like cybersecurity information assurance work. Uh, I was responsible for managing the entire um, high side network for the army nice. and making sure that all of those Cisco routers and switches were um, configured correctly, you know, not VLAN one, but VLAN three type stuff. And what, what year was that? This was 2011. Okay. So 2013. I, I, did, I did basically the same thing for USGFCOM in Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, nice. Yeah. So we probably now. talked back then. then. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so did that, went into um, helping build out an, um, insider threat program mm -hmm. for the Department of the Army. Uh, that was kind of cool. That was my first interactions with ArcSight. So if people are familiar with ArcSight, <laughs> they've been, you know, replaced by some other Sims nowadays. Um, and then I moved back to the DC area and started working for Homeland Security, mm -hmm. uh, working for the different, there was different um, directorates that I worked in um, from requirements gathering to analyzing network traffic for all of the, um, all of the different agencies in the, for the government, um, mostly in the DC area. Um, met up with ArtSight again then, <laughs> did a little incident response for them, and then I moved out to Las Vegas to help build out a vulnerability management team. Um, left the government, left DC, and haven't looked back since. It's been one of those great experiences of moving from public sector to private sector, um, and just the growth and the money and the opportunities, they're so plentiful on this side of things. And Absolutely. now I work for Palo Alto Networks, um, working on SOAR um, automation, helping mm -hmm. customers once they've made the purchase, mm -hmm. I help them implement it and get it set up and running and help them start to realize their um, ROI for getting the product. Nice, nice. I actually work a lot with SOAR um, in okay. the MD MDR that I manage. So I guess okay. it's safe to say that you're from DC original? Not really. Uh, my folks are military. They're retired. Uh, but we spent a lot of time in that area. Um, so I, I do know a number of people, both my 
mom and my stepdad are both in that area still. So awesome. um, I loved it there before the traffic, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> before the construction, before everybody moved. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, I saw the the Redskins shirt. And, uh, I'm I know, a, I'm trying to like hide it because they changed the name. <laughs> they did. They're, they're called what, the Commanders now or something? The like Commanders. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh. I yeah. was a little bit hurt, you know, yeah. when I heard it the other day and I was like, could we have just kept the Washington football team? But, exactly. you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually from D.C. myself. I was, uh, I was born at Walter Reed. Uh, okay. My dad was working at the NSA when I was born. Nice, uh, nice. So kind of born into the community, I guess. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> served some time in the military and intelligence and then became a DOD contractor. So our, our paths are, are fairly similar. Yeah, okay. Where are you located now? I'm actually in Chattanooga, Tennessee now. I moved okay. back from London last year and uh, ended up landing here in Chattanooga. Um, nice. Big difference between Chattanooga and London, but... Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Less rain. <laughs> yeah, less, less rain. Yeah, true, true. And the tea is worse here. The tea was actually really good over there. But, um, well, it's American tea. What do you expect, right? You got. You have to get it imported in. <laughs> I did. I did exactly that. So, yeah, Las Vegas. I'm actually doing work with Alyssa Knight out in uh, Las Vegas, um, yes. writing, writing screenplays for her. My first screenplay will be out next month. She's already shot the film and everything. So Okay, yeah. There's a lot of cybersecurity out in Vegas. Um, I know that you worked at one of the uh, casinos as well, didn't you? I did. I worked for the Venetian and the Palazzo. Um, and it was an interesting experience because I, my friend was like, hey, let's move to Vegas and go work. And I was like, Vegas? It's like 150 degrees in the summer and super cold yeah. in the winter. Why would I do that? And I was like, they don't need, they don't have cybersecurity. <laughs> right? Not really thinking. <laughs> right. Like, in the, the sense of, of cybersecurity. Right. And it was like, wait a minute, they have whole socks out here and whole like teams of folks that do all of the same things that other organizations okay. have. And so um, I highly recommend it. I think it's a really cool place to get some experience and get into cybersecurity. Absolutely. The environment is much different. The risk level and the acceptable risk level is different. Um, I've done yes. a lot of pen tests in casinos mm -hmm. and the gaming floor and the, the business offices and the hotels. It's yeah. a really interesting mixture of architecture. Yes. <laughs> so you also are an author and uh, you have a 501c3 yes. that, that you have. Why don't you talk to me about the uh, charity that you do? So um, I'm one of the founding board members and I currently run the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, AKA Cyber Jitsu. So if you see it out there um, and we provide hands-on training to women and girls looking to enter and advance in cybersecurity. Um, we do hands-on workshops, we do courses to help you get prepped for certifications, we go to conferences together, uh, we do cyber competitions, we love it. Uh, Wicked Six Cyber Games is coming. Um, I have my friend Marcel who's been pivotal in making a lot of the competition stuff we do work. Um, she helps build these competitions for people, um, and it's just a way for us to get more women in cybersecurity, obviously, right. but also give them an opportunity to get hands-on and to get into the technology and not feel like they're alone in this space and that they can't do something, right? right. Um, I, I get emails all the time like, oh my gosh, the workshop that I attended, it, it helped me land this job because I was able to talk about these kind of skills. And so that's mm -hmm. what we do this for, to, to help them feel empowered to be successful. Yeah. Plus, I, I think giving back to the community also helps further the community and keep the legacy going. Yes. Um, I, I've interviewed a lot of people that have 501s that, you know, basically the same, I guess, mentality and idea. Um, I had Tanisha Williams on from Black Girls Hack. Okay. And yep. I, I have to say that charity was, it was really interesting and great people. Like, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. I've never met better people in my life. We had a really good time. Um, <laughs> them and the, the, the group uh, from DC that does the same thing for uh, the communities there that, you know, either they don't have enough money or they don't have the exposure right. to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, I find those, those, uh, those 501s really interesting. Um, I'm actually diving off into starting my own 501 this year uh, for veterans. Uh, don't do but, it. No, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> It's scary. It really is scary when you look at the amount of stuff that has to go into it, the legal counsel and all the yes. legal paperwork. It's just, it's overwhelming. 
Um, and at the same time, I'm trying to start an LLC for consulting as well. So it's just a lot at right. once. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's important for, for us in cybersecurity to, you know, the leadership that's been there for a long time to not just, you know, get to those twilight years and be like, okay, well, I'm done and not leave anything right. behind to help people out. Yeah. Um, so the uh, competition you guys have, uh, kind of mixing hacking cybersecurity with esports. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because that really intrigues me. So that was, we, we hosted the first Wicked Six in Vegas at the HyperX Arena. Um, and the idea behind it was to showcase cyber athletes, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you want to be successful, you have to train, right? And it's the same concept with if you're playing basketball, if you're running track, if you're playing football, whatever, you have to train for that big day. And so um, mixing smaller missions for people to watch and pay attention to versus the ones that are like four days. Nobody's going to sit and watch. Right. Some, I mean, people will, but really, if you want to learn about something, you're not going to sit and watch somebody try to hack at things um, at like a DEF CON, right? right? You're not going to understand what they're doing because they're high level. So we, we brought it back down to a level that people could understand, mm -hmm. brought in shoutcasters, brought in um, interviewers to interview some of the players and just talk about nice. what they're learning. Um, and then the, you can actually watch them on stage uh, with the big screen at the HyperX Arena doing the, you know, fixing the vulnerabilities or looking for ways to figure out how to get into this system or that system. Uh, and it was a really cool experience. And so the one that's coming up is for women only, um, a thousand women over 24 hours um, from around the world. So I'm not getting an invite? Now you can totally come and watch. <laughs> I'm sure we'll put you in there. <laughs> But it's just a way to bring exposure to cybersecurity careers, um, to gaming, to to the learning aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, when I did my first competition, I think Marcel was on the team with us and I had no clue what I was doing, but it was fun, right? Because right. I was in a group of other folks that kind of knew what they were doing, but didn't know either. <laughs> that's awesome. And we could collaborate. <laughs> and, and that's what we try to bring to, to others that are looking to do the same thing. That's really cool, you know, and it's really neat how cybersecurity is starting to blend into those types of events because I think it's really important to embrace, like, not only just the younger generations, but also the gaming side of it yes. because it, it really is a game. You know, yeah. it's a lot of money involved when it comes to real life, but it's definitely right. a game of cat and mouse, right? Yes. Um, so I, I'm a really big, big fan of that. And actually, um, there was a, a group that contacted me from London last week um, to be on the Hacker Hunter docu series, and it's about oh, nice. it's about oh gaming. okay so that's there's, cool. there's, check there's, that out yeah it's on YouTube um, and I think <clears throat> Netflix but they have a lot of really interesting um, docu series and a lot of people that I'm sure you know has have been on previous episodes. Um, so it's, there's a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of innovative stuff going on in the space right now. Uh, it's really exciting for me because, you know, I get to bounce from conference to conference and kind of right. like, <laughs> kick my head in and see what's going on. Um, so and that's the fun you, part. So Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, Charlene, what's your connection with Charlene? So, wait, what's her last name? O'Hannon. O'Hanlon. Yeah, how do, how do we how do we meet? You know, I don't even remember how we met. I meet, so I get so many emails and people are like, hey, I think what you're doing is really cool. I think it's great. Um, and I think we were just connected because of um, the InfoSec Institute partnership oh, yeah. that we just we, we just announced. And we're, we're getting ready to work on some more um, activities and things with them to kind of bring some more awareness to the partnership and to the training that they have and the scholarships that they offer. Um, but that's how I ended up meeting her. And I was just like, oh, she's really cool. I like her. <laughs> I got an email. Just like that when I grow up. <laughs> I got an email from her and she was like, I've got this person you did to interview. She's great. And she's sitting in your name. And I was like, I know her. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a small community. People don't understand that. Is that, yeah. that cybersecurity is, is a huge industry. But mm -hmm. really, the people at the core, it's a very small group of people. Yes. And we're all two separated. Two degrees by of separation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's not much separation <laughs> at all. 
Um, so yeah, I was really excited to have you on the show and I started like digging through your background and, you know, doing my OSINT. What, what did you find that's not cyber related? <laughs> um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't go into a uh, personal life or anything. I just tried to, okay. you know, look at the different connections we had as far as like, uh, our career path and, and stuff like that. So what made you get into cybersecurity? What was your, what was the thought, the breaking point that said, I want to be in cybersecurity? So I actually, before I went to school for IT and tech, I was actually an architecture student. So typically I'll have Legos behind me because I like to build, um, build things. But since I've moved in my office, I don't have it in here yet. But technology based stuff with architecture, but I switched my focus to um, just regular um technology mm -hmm. and i was like okay well what do i want to do i didn't know what i wanted to do and so i you know i took the network engineering job and during that job i went to security plus boot camp and this dude named joe mccray he was teaching the ethical hacker training he came into the classroom and showed us router configurations on the internet yeah. and i was like wait and it was in plain text and i was like oh that's not good <laughs> it's awesome so that kind of steered me towards maybe I need to go this route and you know I wanted to be a, a pen tester at one point in my life um, then I was like yeah I'm over that I'll just do this stuff over here uh, but that's that's kind of how that got started and so I didn't actually get to start doing it until I was working at Fort Bragg and interacting with disastigs and having to make sure oh, that Lord. all those configurations they freaking sucked mm -hmm. but I was a master at it I had a script and everything <laughs> so like copy paste yep. <laughs> but um you know, accreditations and certifications. And then when that contract ended, I ended up getting my actual first cybersecurity job at DHS. Cool, cool. So, yeah. yeah, me and DHS, <laughs> uh, I did a talk for them last month or the month before. Um, we haven't always been friends, but uh, because of my background, but <laughs> okay, you know, we're, we're, we're on speaking terms now. We've been divorced <laughs> for a while and we're, we're finally making up. Um, but yeah, you know, I look at some of the kids coming into the industry and I say kids, I mean, they're young adults, but um, their aspirations, it seems to be everybody wants to be a pen tester first. Yes. Yes. And I, I don't know if that's media driven or if it's just that chance to, to kind of dance on the edge legally. I think it's media driven. Yeah. And I, I think there's not, there's, there aren't enough places that show, hey, you can do all of these things in cybersecurity and they all are sexy and fun and cool and can have that same effect. Uh, we, we get women all the time that'll come through and it's like, I want to be a pen tester. It's like, okay, well, why? <laughs> it's like, well, did you look at this and this and this over here? And they're like, oh, wait. And then like, oh, I think I want to go on the blue team side now, or I think I want to go on the governance and risk side of things, or I think I want to go on the sales engineering side of things. And so, um, I think it's a lack of awareness mm -hmm. and all the TV shows show the people hacking and they make it look cool, you know? And so I was like, Oh, I can do that. I want to do that. And it's, re it's really interesting too. If the media portrays like hackers as like this really sexy thing, with the bells and whistles and mm -hmm. neon green text falling off the screen <laughs> and shit. Right. Um, but what they don't show and it kind of frustrates me is diversity is one. Um, right. There's very little to no diversity in media when it comes to hacking in general. They right. usually so, right. show some tattooed guy like me sitting, you know, with a hoodie on, <laughs> sitting behind a computer, and <laughs> that's not what it always is, you know. Exactly. Um, but what I do find interesting is before I got into security, um, like legal security, I was on the other side, and okay. I was learning the offensive stuff. Um, and I think I, I tell all my analysts that are in the, the, the MDR with me is that to make a truly proficient, uh, I guess, analyst or a pen tester, you have to know both sides. Yes. And so I encourage them to go out and get offensive security certs mm -hmm. as well as blue team certs. Yep. Because to me, if you're sitting behind a computer and you're looking at, let's say, I don't know, Dark Trace or, or throw any name of app in there. Um, and you see alerts coming across, all you see is the back end of it. Right. And I tell people that if you really want to stop what's going on, you have to know how it starts. Yep. You um, have to know how they got in, how they even 
you know, manage to get social engineer their self into the space. Exactly, you know, exactly. What vulnerabilities do you have out there that allowed this to happen and understanding how to fix that? You know. Exactly. And I think, I think it's great that you, that you open up the different principles to security so that people understand there's not just pen testing and there's right. not just, you know, defensive stuff. There's all kinds of stuff involved. When I got to USJFCOM, uh, this is what put me back on the red team was a year at USJFCOM working in the CMD cell. Um, it was <laughs> just a gold disc and EI retina <laughs> and routine password checks. Like Dude. it was so monotonous that I thought I was going to die in that place. It was horrible, <laughs> but it gave, it gave me an idea as to what I really wanted to do. Um, and I, and I've been back and forth, you know, I'll be on, I'll lead a red team for a year and then I'll jump over mm. and, and help somebody build a sock. Um, but I but just love yeah yeah and that that helps you keep your your skills up one Absolutely. plus you're able to bring you know that exposure and that experience from the other side to the table when it comes time to do that yeah and I think that it takes different mindsets as well like for someone to truly have a passion in red team not hacking but true red team right not just point click script kitty I'm using Metasploit boom I got a show I'm talking like really analyzing code and really getting in deep and get your hands into it I think that is kind of a, uh, I think it's a mindset that you're kind of born with. Um, yeah. And defense is so, sort of the same thing. Those are usually your more empathetic people who, who want to help people, who want to give back. I've seen nurses go from hospitals to socks um, to That's do defense. Awesome. Yeah, because they, they have that mindset. Yeah. So do you see a lot of that? Do you see a lot of <clears throat> cross industry into cybersecurity? Yes. Um, a number of our members are career changers. They come in, you know, from like accounting, business, library, info sector, but she was a librarian turned, yep. you know, cybersecurity analyst because <laughs> those skills definitely work over there. Um, and so we, we see a lot of, because they see the opportunity, right? right? They see the money mm -hmm. and they see that, hey, I don't have to work 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours a week all the time. <laughs> You know, and so we definitely will get that. And, and the fact that they have that different mindset, they can think differently, um, they can bring in those skills, it helps the teams that they're on. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the, the only bad thing I think about having so many facets to cybersecurity is if someone really has a passion for cybersecurity, it's really easy to burn out. Oh, yeah. So what do you do to help keep yourself from getting to that point where you're burned out? Because you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I take breaks and I have a lot of wine. I have, uh, I have, <laughs> we make wine here in Las Vegas. And so <laughs> we make it every season and we, we, we keep a stash of wine um, on hand. But no, when I start to feel like I'm going down that path of burning out, because it happens regularly. I think I had burnout something last summer, right? You know, it's COVID and we're trying to, we're trying to still make sure we're getting activities out to people and still do other stuff and still work my day job. And then I have a business that I run as well. Mm -hmm. um, you have to just take a step back. Yeah. And that's when self-care comes in. Um, whether that's making wine, whether that's, I build Legos. I have the Titanic Lego set sitting out there <laughs> yeah. awesome. on the table. Um, it's not open yet. I have to finish my project downstairs, but um, I try to find ways to release, you know, home projects. I, I crochet, I cross stitch, typical old lady stuff, right? Um, but it, it helps me take my mind away from the, the day in and day out of cybersecurity stuff. And then it helps me refresh and I can come back to it later on and not feel so burned out. Right. And I think a lot of it comes to is that when you first get in the industry and let's say you don't necessarily have a name for yourself and you try to make your, your path, it's almost like overnight you end up in a place where you look at, I guess, newspaper articles or talks that you've given and realize mm -hmm. that you're, you're moving into a different segment of cybersecurity. Yes. Yeah. And it happens so quick that you're not ready for all of, I guess, you know, the, the talks or the interviews or the projects. And then all of a sudden you're wrapped into it and you get stuck and you're like, wait a minute, what do I do for myself now? Do I still have my own identity? <laughs> exactly. I actually, on, to be honest with you, um, right before COVID, I was starting to go through that. And I was like, wait, 
I got to find time for me. And then COVID happens. Right. And then it, I think stuff picked up. You know, it's like, hey, I need you to speak on this. Hey, I need you to speak this. It's like, wait a minute. It's virtual now. I get it. But I don't want to speak every week. <laughs> oh, and it happens. It happens. And it happens. Because, because we're virtual, it's, it's easier just to jump on here, do the presentation, and then keep it open. And you could do that every single day of the week. Yeah. But it's like, you got to say no sometimes. And people are afraid to say no. I was afraid to say no for the longest. I say no now. I'm like, I give you somebody else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's the hardest part for me is I, I feel like if someone says, hey, you know, I want you to be in this film or, hey, I want you to speak here or, you know, write this or do that. I feel, feel like if I say no, then I'm yeah. risking being relevant. And yes. maybe I won't get that call again. Yep. You know, and it, that's, it's so bad because you have that thought, but then also like imposter syndrome, like mm -hmm. why do they want me to talk there? You know, it's, right. it's, exactly. a, it's a battle. It's, it's, a battle. A, it's definitely a battle. And I think everybody faces it. Oh yeah. You know, a, my friend the other day, he was like, go look at your LinkedIn and then tell yourself, would you hire that person? And that's how you know you can sit back and relax because you've done all of the things and you're, you're making an impact and you don't have to continuously be deep in the weeds anymore because you've, right. you've gotten to that point. And I was just like, you know what? That's a really good point. You have to coach yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's definitely that self-care, you know, like, yeah. you know, yeah. when you get to, and there's ups and downs too. Right. So I, I've gone through a lot of, you know, building groups and, and watching things fail um, mm -hmm. same time watching things succeed. But one thing I learned, like I was a, a true perfectionist when it came to, uh, fear of failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. but I finally had to embrace the fact that I can't be successful unless I'm able to let myself fail as well. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people don't get that getting in cybersecurity, you know, like some analysts will get an alert and let's say they miss the analysis, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're totally way off. I've seen analysts like, go into a depression over it. I'm like, look, you're going to fail. I, wow. I want you to fail. I want right. you to ask questions. <laughs> exactly. That's how, that's how you grow. Right. That's exactly. how you learn. <laughs> but there's a lot, I think there's a lot of people in cybersecurity that are, that are very much the perfectionist. And I think our industry attracts yeah. a lot of that too. And I, I think, I think social media plays a big part in that. Oh, huge. Because everybody has this, if you have somebody posted today on Twitter, should companies hire folks based on their follower count? <laughs> I <was> like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Their follower count? contest. <laughs> do you realize that half the folks that have these big followings probably don't do anything? Like, they're not the experts, but they're seen as the expert. They're seen right. as the people that we should follow, but we don't really know their true story and how they got to that place. And that's dangerous. And that's, and exactly. So now everybody that's coming behind them, they're like, oh my God, I have to do all of these things all at once so that I can be relevant and be, you know, at the forefront of things. And it's like, you don't have to do all that. Right. If you want to, you can, right? But you don't have to fill your 24 hours up with something every single day. Yeah, and social media tends to be a cancer when it comes to cybersecurity because there's so much misinformation Yes. And there's so many people that have a voice that shouldn't. Yeah. That, that should not. Shouldn't. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, why are you talking again? <laughs> exactly. And a lot why of cert companies, <laughs> a lot of certification companies are like that too. Um, I remember <clears throat> I had Alyssa um, Miller on the show last year. Mm -hmm. And this was shortly after the debacle with uh, EC Council. Yeah. And, you know, I, one of my first certifications, I, I got a day off and I went to yeah. test for the CEH and I was shocked at how easy it was. Yeah. And they've, they've made a living off of that test. Yes. And also plagiarism. And I, I have version seven. <laughs> I have version phone. one. <laughs> well, it didn't get better in version seven. <laughs> no, I, I took, yeah. I took version one. They asked me if. I would help write version two. And I was like, mm, I don't know about that. Like, <laughs> I think I'll, I think I'll, just, you know, refrain from that. Um, but yeah, certification. I've heard they've gotten better. What's that? I've heard they've gotten better. 
now they have like labs and stuff. I don't know. I haven't, I don't want to ever take anybody's certification again. So no, no. I just keep stuff up to date and pay the fees and because I'm not going back down that path. <laughs> that's, that's one of my pet peeves about our industry is when we get newcomers wanting to get into cybersecurity and the entry level jobs that are requiring these $5,000 certifications. Yep. It blows my mind. Like I wish that they would stop with the certification, you know, requirement, because all that tells me is that person was able to study for one test right, and pass that one test. It tells me nothing else about that person, right. but that is, is the base true? requirement. DOD required yes. CEH, required it. Security plus. <laughs> yes. And I was yeah. just shocked. These people are depending <laughs> on certs that are work that have like zero value. Um, you know, when it comes to people learning security, if they have that money to take security plus, or, or if they want to take the, the ethical hacking certification, it's cool. But I don't think companies should be like, okay, well, you know, I know it's an entry level job and it's only going to pay you like 50 grand a year, but we need you to go out and get three certifications before we'll hire, we'll hire you. I think right. that's, that's insane. They yeah. should, they should be willing to pay for that. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of the certification companies now, um, they are trying to, the, the courses are too expensive, no doubt, but they, yeah. a lot of them do have programs where people like vets and women and mm -hmm. minorities can participate for free, yeah. you know, yeah. which is kind of, which is cool because you're giving that opportunity to somebody um, <clears throat> that may not have the resources to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. like, that's why I took security plus because it was a DOD thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, well, if you're going to pay for education, fine, I'll take this. And that kind of spun me on the certification track. <laughs> yeah, I think I think when I first got in, um, SANS was was really big back then. And I was so disenfranchised after I took their exam. So SANS was really respected back then. And they probably still are now. I just haven't like taken any courses. Um, but I challenged like three of their certifications in one day and took it, passed it. And then they put me on an audit board because I thought I cheated because I passed all three. And I was like, because <laughs> nobody's done that. <laughs> you should look at your content. <laughs> so well, it's open notes. Well, I don't know if it was open book back then, but yeah. oh, so they're open book now. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So you can, you can bring in all of the books. You can bring in any kind of materials you want. You can take notes. They recommend you do an index. Um, wow. Still expensive. Yeah. But they, they allow you to use your notes, which is cool because when you're working on the job, mm -hmm. you're going to pull a book off the shelf if you don't know something to reference sure. or Google it. Yeah. <laughs> like, <What? laughs> uh, hello. <laughs> so they've, they've gotten better with that part. Uh, I'm a science advocate. I've got six of their certifications. Three, Somebody three. else paid for it. So <laughs> I let them pay for it. Um, but... They are, they are one of those groups that are trying to make it more accessible and they're offering scholarships to people because SANS training, we know everybody wants it and all of the companies want it. Oh, for sure. So it's like, all right, let's, let's see how we can help drive more vets and more women and more, more minorities into the space. Let's offer some free stuff. I do like their content. Their content is really in depth. It's and, really good. And you can dive off into all kinds of places with yes. SANS. Like I, I have yeah. the GHTQ and the GCIH. Okay. And one other one. Um, but the hacking techniques and the forensics I found like mm -hmm. combined into the same cert was really awesome. Yes. Uh, that was cool. I like that too. Yeah. They've got some, they, and they've got really good instructors. Mm -hmm. Like so, a lot of these folks have been working in the industry forever. They know this stuff. Yeah. They do this stuff on a regular basis. And so that's who you want building out content. Cause they're like, all right, these are the basic skills you need to know right. for this type of job. After this, you need to go and continue to research and do, you know, more deep dives. But here's some basic stuff. Learn this. And people get jobs out of, off, you know, they'll finish the boot camp and then they got a job two weeks yeah. later. It's yeah. like, dang, how'd you do that? Because they're able to talk to those concepts. They're able yeah. to express that and explain it. Yeah, I get people that, that are on interviews that mm -hmm. I'm interviewing for like a SOC position or whatever. And, you know, it really, they put a lot of pressure on themselves because I'll ask a question. If they don't understand it, mm -hmm. they try to like make something up. And I'm like, <laughs> if, you, if you don't know it, it's okay. Because I, there's no way I would know everything about anything. 
Um, on a daily basis, I'm researching, I'm looking stuff up, I'm learning mm -hmm. new things. There's no way to, to know everything about cybersecurity because it's right. so complex. Um, but I'd like to see like less reliance on certifications for entry level. Um, I get so tired of hearing the skills gap and the jobs that aren't filled because of the skills gap. It drives me insane. It, that drives me nuts. I'm like, have you guys talked to the people that you don't normally talk to? I guarantee you they've got the skills needed for this particular right. role. Right. And maybe you don't understand what this role needs. <laughs> or they just don't understand the role at all. Like I've been in companies where they'll, you know, I'll say, hey, I have a position open for a level one analyst. And mm -hmm. they'll write the job description they'll do the first round of interviews and when they get to me i'm like what what <laughs> did you not <laughs> do you not know what we do like this is not even the same problem <laughs> so yeah i think there's a lot we have a lot of uh, room for, for growth in industry when it comes to yeah. hiring the right people and being able to do it efficiently um, yes. i think we lose a lot of people in the hiring process not just because the roles aren't well defined but also because diversity right like, look at neurodiversity. Um, there's a lot of people out there with mm -hmm. aut autism or on the spectrum that don't handle interviews very well. Right. But, but they're super, smart. Super smart. And yeah. we're losing those people. Exactly. Because we're it's stereotypes. We assume that they can't learn and that they don't know what they're talking about. It's like, yeah, but they just learn differently. Mm -hmm. So how about we meet them where they're at and see how we can work this out? There's so much, we have so much talent within cyber jitsu. It's freaking crazy. And we'll see people, I can't get this job. I can't get this job. It's like, but you have the skill set. You know, what, what's really happening? And I've, I've seen some companies starting to make a change and starting to do things a little bit differently, but they can't hire everybody. Right. They can't fill the 3 million jobs that are open. You know, <laughs> it takes a collective effort right, <laughs> of right. everybody to say, okay, Let's make this change. Let's let's give people the opportunity to come in and show us what they have. And if they don't have the skills, okay, fine. Let's give them some training. And if they're still not receptive to it, then they got to go someplace else. Right. But let's give them those opportunities to at least show us that they can be successful. And I'm really glad the last 10 years, there's been a real big uh, push and kind of like a campaign for diversity. Uh, when I first came into the industry, it was driven by middle-aged males, white males, <laughs> who didn't want to share information yep. and held on to the keys of the kingdom and wouldn't let anybody know the magic, <laughs> the magic that went on. Um, and now we're starting to see a, a huge change with that. I think we're going in the right yeah. direction. I think we have a long way to go, but I think we're on the right path for sure. Yeah, I, we're definitely moving where we're supposed to. Um, it's just going to take more people. Yeah. to actively and be intentional about making that change, you know, to say, all right, let's hire from within, you know, let's move folks up that deserve to be moved up, that have the skills and the qualifications. Let's, let's get them prepped and trained up to do that next level of whatever it is at the company. Um, and because people aren't staying in companies anymore. No. no. Unless you really, really <laughs> just like what you do, people aren't staying because there's more money next door. And so if you want to keep those people and get them to that level, you have to, you have to pour into them. You have to, right. you have to invest. You have to invest. Exactly. I mean, it's, it, if you really look at it, it's a monetary investment when yeah. you promote people. Yep. Um, but yeah, a lot of that goes on. Uh, people don't hire from within. Um, one of the things that, that I like to focus on uh, the interns that I have um, mm -hmm. I will look at an intern before I will go outside the company for a level one analyst because they're doing their time right. and yep. you know, they're most of them are going to school and working and mm -hmm. it shows dedication and commitment. Yep. So that part's <laughs> covered and the knowledge of the platform that we use, they already have it. So right. why would you go outside? Right. You don't have to train them up as much <laughs> versus having to train somebody from scratch, which is fine, but look within you know, but if they don't have good diverse, like if they don't have diverse candidates within, yeah. <laughs> they probably need to bring some in first <laughs> right. and then start to, to build that out. So what is your biggest pet peeve when it comes to cybersecurity? And what is the one thing that keeps you going in cybersecurity? Biggest pet peeve. <laughs> 
There's got to be one. Oh, there's plenty. Um, <laughs> people not doing the research. So most of the stuff, most of the basic stuff is out there on the internet. You know, if you follow certain people, you'll, you'll get the answers to your questions. But people asking basic stuff. And it's like, did you go and research first before you came? Yeah. Um, or folks asking questions, even at work. And they're like, I don't understand this. Or I don't see this. And it's like, did you research first? Mm. Because all the information is there. It's like they want you to hold their hand and just spoon feed everything to you. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Because if you don't take the initiative now, you're never going to take the initiative later. Now, do you think you're, that's a, a generational thing? Or do you think that's just people in general? I think it's just people in general. Um, the, this newer generation, I think, is a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like on the cusp of that generation. But um, we also see it in some of the... I guess not boomers, but who's after the boomers? Um, whoever's after the boomers, Gen, those Gen folks. Gen, Gen Z. Gen, Gen Z, Z is yeah. Gen so X we'll, is see, we'll see that, that group too, want to be spoon fed. It's like, but how did you get through your life? <laughs> you know, come, if you're going to talk to me and you have a question, tell me what you did to try to solve this. Right. And then I can help you better because now I know what not to tell you because <laughs> you've already done it, right? Don't just come and say help without having some sort of information behind it. Right. And then what was the other question? What motivates you to keep going? <sighs> when I get emails that say, hey, you helped me do X, Y, Z. Like, oh, you know, that conversation or I watched one of your podcast or your webinar and you, you said this one thing and you know that that kicked me in the in the rear end and now I'm like doing all this blah 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 those kind of emails that's yeah. what keeps me keeps me going I totally get that for sure um the, going back to to the pet peeve you know I think it's really funny when someone will find me on discord or find me on the internet and say I really want to do what you do how do, <laughs> how do you learn that how do you how did you learn that and I'm like, bro, <laughs> first of all, first of all, we didn't have the luxury of Google back when I started. So really? all you, In all our phone. you right. <laughs> all you gotta do is go to the internet. It's all there. Like you could literally there. teach yourself everything I do by watching videos. You yep. don't have to, you don't have to do what we did and have to bust through and, and figure right. stuff out on your own. It's there. Exactly. It's there. And and they could, hey, you see me talking and you see what I do, go read my stuff. Yeah. You know, like, go look at this. Use your resources that you have. And they have a ton of resources. Like, I, I look back to when people like me and Chris Roberts, some of the, the old guard started back <laughs> in the day. And we didn't have those luxuries. You know, it, right. it was a very close community and people mm -hmm. held tight to information. They, If you went into IRC and said, Hey, how do you hack this? You would get flamed. Like it, yeah, it would, yeah. they would kick you off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> now it's like, all right, here, here's the script. <laughs> yeah. Here's how you do this. Go on the dark web and find it. <laughs> but I, I do think that, that causes an issue too, because we have, like you said, we have a lot of people coming into the industry that the first thing they want to be is pen testers. Mm -hmm. But they've learned how to pen test through bad means when they go to a certification company and they're handed Metasploit and shown <laughs> just how to configure the exploit, but don't understand what the exploit does. No, but right. Yeah. And I see a lot of that. People call themselves pen testers that should not be touching systems. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what this does and what the effect of it will be, you probably should sit back <laughs> and learn about that first. <laughs> it, it reminds me of my first failure. So I was, uh, in Connecticut doing a pen test for a very large global company. And they had, a, I think it was an Avaya phone system. And okay. I was doing a voice over IP pen test. Okay. So I get there and I wanted to run a vulnerability, vulnerability scan first. So I ran Nessus against the Avaya call server and it physically melted the line cards. I was gonna say, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> And so Avaya came out to the property and they're like, we've never seen this before. And come to find out there was a vulnerability in their firmware on that card that caused that meltdown oh. that, that they had no idea about. But wow. I, 
I thought I was just doing my job, you know, like you were, yeah. <laughs> but you it was, know, it's one of the scary things when everybody looks up over their cubicle and nobody has phone service. <laughs> it's like, who did it? <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute. Let me, let me duck down real quick and check. <laughs> I feel like Neo running from agent Smith in the building. That's how I felt when I was at my first job. Um, when I didn't quite understand how changing the VLAN mm -hmm. while the system is on without putting the new, the new IP on the new VLAN will shut it all down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to get on the phone and call a number of folks. Luckily, they didn't use their high side networks like that. So they didn't, they didn't even see it. But right. it's like, hey, can you go unplug that, that uh, switch for me? Because <laughs> I'm testing. <laughs> Collision here. <laughs> I'm like, crap. I shut their whole network down. I did that all the time. Then I was like, all right, cool. Let me do this, make sure it's correct before mm -hmm. I just put this in there and blast everything away. Um, but yeah, that was that was super funny. I was so embarrassed. Numer I'm just like, oh, I gotta call somebody again. I don't want to tell my teammates because they're gonna be like, this girl doesn't know what she's doing. I'm I'm taking things down. It worked out. I learned my lesson. So uh, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna assume that was one of your low points. So what is one of your high points for your career? Ooh. To be honest, running a nonprofit. Well, okay. So I'm not gonna. This is gonna be on camera, but. Running nonprofits is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But <clears throat> when you see other organizations um, following in your footsteps and doing similar things and trying to, you know, change how they do stuff, it's, it's really kind of rewarding. It kind of, you know, it stings like, wait a minute. But then it's like, but you know what? Obviously, we're doing something right. And people see that. And so it's like flattery, I guess, is the best form of imitation is the best form of flattery or something. Right, right. Um, but yeah. running a nonprofit, I think, has probably been one of the highlights. Cool. You know, yeah. I get to meet so many people. I get I get to meet people like you, um, people at conferences, uh, heads of organizations, and it's just kind of a, one of those cool things that I never really saw myself doing. Mm -hmm. um, I found cyber jitsu because I failed the CISSP the first time. You actually took the CISSP. Uh, yes, I do have it. I took it twice. Um, somebody recommended I failed it by four points and I was more upset that I had to pay the money again to take the test than that I failed. <laughs> so I found a study group in, in uh, Virginia and that was in 2013. Yeah, so since the very beginning, it, it was, I was just like, oh, this is some club. It's not gonna do anything. And the fact that, you know, we started to see these women and I met all of these awesome people uh, through the process, I was like, oh, this is actually something important you know there's important work being done here and so yeah the cssp that was one of the one of my very first uh managers in cybersecurity, llewellyn Derry from nec um tried to encourage me to get the cssp <laughs> and i fought that tooth and nail and i was just like no that's for managers i will never be a manager i'll always be a hacker i don't want anything to do with management and uh <laughs> I didn't end up taking it. Um, okay. I, I grew into my role. And, um, you know, I think the biggest part that turned me off about the CISSP was the fact that you have to continuously keep it up. And with so many things going on, I was like, there's yes. no way I will fail at keeping that up. I will forget about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that is definitely one thing. When CompTIA went to that method, I was like, come on, CompTIA, really? I think they're all going that way. And, and at some point you, you get to the, it's like, do I really need this certification anymore? Right. So I've got a ton of technical certifications, but I, I don't do anything now that my certifications would, co would cover. Right. Except for the one that I got from Palo Alto, because it's specifically about our product. Right. All of the rest, nothing, you know? So it's like, okay, at what point do you not, go after certifications, right. you know, because if you move into manager roles, those certifications don't matter. No. So it's like, okay, well, I've been paying on these things for, shoot, I don't know, 10 years now at this point. <laughs> it's like, do I really keep doing it or do I just let them expire and say, hey, I had them. Right. Um, you can see the knowledge that I have. I don't know. I think, I think that's where we're lucky is we're at that point where we don't necessarily have to go out and and beat down the doors, get certifications that, right. you know, at this point, it'd be kind of ir like irrelevant. Um, 
but I mean, they do, they do keep people moving and, and keep people yes. interested. And I think it's important for the people who want to be in cybersecurity, but you know, they get complacent or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, could do hacking and security research 24 hours a day. As a matter of fact, I do a lot of that all the time. Um, so I don't really need yeah. that, that push to keep going and taking classes. Um, but one thing I do want to finish this year is my degree. I, I have a ton of college credit, probably enough for a bachelor's, um, okay. but it's all, it's all in science. So oh, that's like, okay. <laughs> I'm, one of, I'm one, of those, one of those picky learners where I don't want to do history and all that other stuff. I just want science and computer. So, but you do know you will have to take the other stuff to finish, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to try social engineering, social engineering my way out of that one. You could totally clip them. I yeah, mean, I think CLEP, CLEP exams are still a thing um, or audit the course or something. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, right. you, just just suck it up and, you know, take it take it for eight weeks and be done with it. <laughs> eight weeks <laughs> a know, long time. It, it really is, but it might it might be fun. Yeah. So another thing, too, that you mentioned is that people don't stay at jobs for more, you know, for a very long time. And I've been, I looked at my career and I looked at all the positions I've had and it's really strange. There's like a cycle. It's like mm -hmm. every year and a half, it's a new yep. job. And I think a lot of that has to do with <clears throat> technology yeah, and the way things are moving in that space. So when I went commercial, one of the first uh, certifications besides the ethical hack certification I got was ArcSight. You mentioned ArcSight. Yep. Yep, I, I got, got one of those too. <laughs> I got my ACSA and it became like a mute point after a while because everybody it went from arc site to things like dark trace to things yep. like you know different sims that are out and there's so many of them. I mean mm -hmm. I, I can't even yeah. count how many sims and how many platforms there are. Uh, but yeah, our, our industry moves very fast and you know it's it's really hard to retain uh, employees when it moves that fast, if you're not moving with the industry. Right. And I think that's a key point. And the industry never keeps up with the pay either. Um, that's another problem. <laughs> yeah. And that's why people leave. Yeah. You know, it's like, all right, I got this experience. I can talk to it. I'm going to go over here and get $30,000 more. Right. You know, and I can better support my family. I'm out. I don't need to stay. I stayed at the Venetian for four years. That's the longest I was ever at any job in my entire career. But that environment, I, I, I could probably yeah. go to Caesars or the Venetian <laughs> and work there and probably work there for the rest of my life. A lot of people do. Yeah. And they'll, they'll just be in those roles. And it's like, okay, because you have the opportunity to, I started in vulnerability management, helping build out that. And then I moved into architecture. So I was able to after, well, well I guess, it, you know what? You change jobs after two years. I changed jobs after two years, <laughs> but still at the same company. <laughs> so, because I was, I was starting to get bored and I wanted to do something different so that I could continue to, you know, keep my skills up and refine my skills. And once people start getting bored, stagnant, needing more money, it's like, all right, I got to go someplace else. Yeah. And I think what drove me to, to jump from place to place too is that if I see, you know, an organization that, I feel like I could help improve and I feel like I'm limited to my influence and it continues to fail. Like I have to pack a bag, yep. um, you know, and that, that happens quite often because you get these startups. I worked in startups for a long time. And I think that is one of the challenges with startup companies is that, mm -hmm. you know, they don't allow that influence because they're more interested in funding and the right. board and, you know, right. getting through those rounds of funding. Um, so anybody listening that, that is thinking about getting into cybersecurity, uh, take into consideration the experience that I had <laughs> with startups and go for something solid. I've, I've heard I've heard that story too because I wanted to last year I was like I'm going to go find a startup to work for because I want to make sure I get equity if they get bought or sold and blah blah blah. And people were like, yeah, so that's a needle in a haystack if that happens. <laughs> I've been at two startups that I left. And so Sapira Viper Labs, I was there doing voiceover IP security re research. They okay. got bought by Avaya. I was with Shortel out in Palo okay. Alto's neck of the woods. Yeah. And they, they got bought by Mitel and I missed both those payouts. <laughs> so you got to stick, stick it out for a little longer. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so, so people listening and, and getting into cybersecurity, don't put all your eggs into a startup company unless you're willing to stay longevity. Yes, you got to stay like, for the long run because that's, that's like, how you get paid out. Exactly. And that's like playing the Vegas odds. It can or it can't pay out. Exactly. So we're close to the end of the hour and it's been a blast having you on. I really enjoyed it. Um, and while you're out in Vegas, since you live there, you should stop by Alyssa Knight's offices. They're doing a, they're building a studio. So yeah, she was telling us that on, um, she was on a podcast last week or two weeks ago. And I was like, really? Yeah. Cause she's doing some, she said she was doing some crazy stuff. And I was oh. like, well, I need to be a part of that. We're, that, we're, that team. <laughs> we're, we're doing cyber short films. I have never written anything in my life. And she encouraged that's, me to that's pretty come, cool. come write for her. And it was, it was a blast. I have a good time. She's a great person. Um, yes. Before we go, any questions for me regarding a group or, or me or whatever? Um, you should speak at our conference. I will absolutely June. do that. I will okay. do it. We'll, we'll put you on the schedule. Um, what questions do I have? What's your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby right now, I have so many, but right now, uh, my favorite hobby is 3D printing. And I've, I actually have a print going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> what are you printing? <laughs> what are you don't making? Don't laugh. Don't laugh. <laughs> I, have, I have a Maine Coon kitten who's sitting right next to me. And like a real Maine Coon? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's going he's gonna to be 25 pounds or so. Um, but he likes to jump up on my Titan chair which is very expensive okay and i've had enough of it so i am printing cat deterrent braces to put on a chair that have little studs on it where he doesn't like to jump on it and i'm printing a ton of them and putting them everywhere okay that's oh, interesting i want to see this when you're finished <laughs> i have some already but so so here's the thing is i i usually work at my desk right and if I leave the room and I have Slack open or, or maybe an email, he has a chance to walk across my keyboard. <laughs> and, and send then messages. Look, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So I'm trying to keep from getting fired. So putting cat deterrent up there might be good. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll absolutely speak at your conference. Send me the details. Um, okay. You know, I'm totally free. So. Okay. Perfect. We'll make it work. But we'll I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on and uh, I look forward to, to working with you in the future. And if you, if you guys ever need help doing anything, just let me know. I will definitely. Can we see the cat? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to wake him up. I have, me too. Almost 25 pounds. He's just a kitten. Aww. <laughs> His name is he's not going to get big. That's oh, so cute. <laughs> I don't even like cats. You know how old he is right now? How old? Nine weeks. Oh, my jeez. That's a big, yeah. Okay. His paws are like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. My friend has savannas and um, boy and a girl, but I think they're like F2s, maybe oh, F3s. Yeah. So they're not, they don't, they, they're not as big as what savannas can get, but they can jump the eight foot wall. Mm -hmm. um, they'll stand up on the counter. Like they'll put the paws up and see over the counter. And I'm just like, this is why I don't like cats because they be all in stuff, yep. scratching yep. stuff up. I don't want them to be over the bed, like ready to claw my eyes out. Yeah. So. <laughs> don't don't watch Pet Cemetery. <laughs> the new one, <laughs> or the all old of one? Them. All, all of them. them. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. On. So awesome. Cool. But yeah, it was great talking to you as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I've I've looked forward to it. So you guys have a, a good rest of, rest of your weekend and good luck on the five hundred one and all your endeavors. And uh, I look to look forward to having you back on the show at some point. So. Awesome. Will do. I'll bring my team. Absol absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. All right. Talk to you I'll soon. talk to you soon. Thanks, guys.